Welcome to the sixth of our talks on machine translation. MT, perhaps more than other fields, relies on large collections of data. And this applies to both statistical methods as well as rule-based methods where human experts should regularly consult monolingual and parallel corpora. It is good to remind ourselves of the well-known truth that the more data you have, the better. Let me repeat. And there's just this universal rule, more data is better data. And again. And here's just a graph of uh, proving this point again, that, that more data still helps. Here we have it in writing. This is one of the famous Google papers where they use all the English internet text uh, to improve their translation quality. And obviously, the more text they fed in, the better the output quality was. This is another example in word classification task. And again, here, the more data you have in the system, the better uh, the accuracy. And this is an older paper that reminds us that dictionaries are actually data too. So how much is more data these days? At one point I made an estimation, and it's a totally cooked up number by me, so don't trust me on this. So the text you read in your lifetime might be 300 million words. This is kind of a guess that maybe you spend an hour reading a book a day, and then just multiplying that up over your lifetime. Uh, the amount of translated text we have is in the order of billions of words for some language pairs. So this is, we have more translated text available to train these systems than you will ever able to read. That's kind of stunning. Collecting these huge amounts of data is obviously very demanding. So people share the efforts. And even big companies are happy to give uh, such data for free away. So you can get all the engrams uh, of the internet from Google for free. And you can also uh, get all the books that get, they scanned broken into very short segments of a few words for free. And there are also community efforts in collecting large data. This is Common Crawl, a nonprofit organization that collects everything from the internet and puts the text together and lets it, uh, researchers to download it for free. So researchers can create their own engram collections and the Moses engram counts are actually better than the Google uh, uh, engram counts because these are unpruned. So that means larger and more precise statistics. This is another collection, very famous collection of uh, parallel corpora, uh, Opus, the Open Parallel Corpus. And here's something for all our Eurosceptics. Uh, it's great that the EU regulates everything and that all the regulations are published in uh, all uh, European official languages. So here is a regulation that talks about nuts and vegetables and vinegar and cigarettes. And it's, it's parallel English and Czech. So we know what the English and Czech words are for explosives and handbags for shoes and glassware, for vehicles and watches, for toys and antiques. In 2007, we had a look at how different types of training data contribute to the translation quality. Our corpus had four main parts. Two, two parts of that were produced by professional translators, and the green part was actually in domain. It was the new types of text that we wanted to translate in the end in our test set while the other part of the professional translated data, the black part, was unrelated text. It was well written, but not, uh, it had nothing uh, to do uh, with uh, our test corpus. The other two parts of the training data were supplied by the community. So these were volunteers, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, they were even not uh, native speakers of the target language they were translating into. A very small fragment of the corpus was community supplied and we were allowed to use it uh, uh, and we knew that we were allowed to use it. While the other part and the major part of what the community supplied had very unclear copyright uh, conditions so no one knew whether we were allowed to use the text or not. We examined the translation quality on two axes. One is the well known blessed score as discussed last time and the other one is the out of vocabulary rate, the amount of unknown words in input text. So if you take only the community supplied training data, uh, which has clear copyright uh, restrictions, you are not going to get a high blast score and also your out of vocabulary rate is going to be pretty high. In our case it was about 5%. 5% of our input words were not uh, listed in the training corpus at all. If we combine that together with the other part of community supply data, the out of vocabulary rate uh, decreases quite a bit because that's a lot of data that we are adding but the blur doesn't increase very much. And that's because we are still staying out of domain. These texts are not very much related to the news text that we are translating. And also because this is non-professional translators, so they do not produce nice uh, sequences of words. If we take professionally translated out of domain text, 
then both the blast score is better and the autofocular rate is also better. That means that this is somewhat nicer translation. And if we combine all the all these three bits together, uh, again both uh, scales uh, get slightly better. In contrast to that, using just the in-domain training data gives us much better blast scores right away and somewhat uh, higher autofocular rate. So some words get unknown, but in general the sequences of words that the system produces are nicer and better fit uh, for what the test set expects. Using both uh, uh, sources of uh, professional translated uh, data, we improve both uh, our blast scores uh, and uh, the autofocular rate, but already uh, by a very little uh, extent. And that's because we have already had enough text in domain and we are only adding out of domain things, so uh, these are not going to help us too much. And putting everything together uh, as the training data uh, helps us only in terms of uh, the out of vocabulary rate, so only more words are covered by the system and the blast scores no longer increase. The situation is slightly different if we test uh, uh, the settings in an out of domain corpus, so some unrelated text not related to any of the, uh, of the specific text in, in our training data. And the short uh, message here is that the more data you have, the better both in terms of out of vocabulary rate and uh, also the blast score. So if you know that your system is going to face unexpected and out of domain data, be sure to feed it with everything you can. And uh, the more data you feed in, the better will be, will be both your out of vocabulary rates as well as the blast scores. Apparently also Google train on everything they can get. Here I show you an example where I gathered some uh, parallel text in my hotel room in Berlin. Uh, it didn't add that much to the uh, total corpus we have. Okay, the more the merrier. As the Google paper says, for every doubling of your training data, you get about half a black point improvement. So if you take the whole internet text, uh, you'll get about 44 black points. And if you take two worlds or four worlds of internet text, you can get to 45. Now oh, hang on, where do we get two or four worlds? The short and fashionable answer is crowdsourcing. You hire a lot of workers for a little bit of money and obtain a little bit of useful data and quite some noise. An extreme version of this is that you don't pay anything at all and you just collect what people produce themselves. For example, the Twitter. There are papers emerging that are able to gather parallel texts or snippets from social media like tweets. And by the way, we are just launching our service to support community translation of tweets, so join us. Obviously, all the Wikipedias and dictionaries uh, and their aggregates like Babelnet uh, should be also listed here. They are all comparable corpora for us. The long explanation of the diminishing returns we get as we are collecting more and more data lies in one of the power laws that you will find everywhere in natural language processing or NLP. It's the Zipf's law. The Zipf's law states that if you take any text, such as this sentence, that some of the words in it will be very frequent and there will be a very long list of words that are rather infrequent. And indeed, already in this beginning of the sentence, we have two occurrences of the definite article, the most frequent English word. So if you order all words along their frequencies, the first item will be the definite article. And the definite article alone will contribute to some huge portion of your corpus. The next frequent items will be full stop, comma, then the preposition of, then the verb to be, and so on. If you take these first five most frequent words and you see, and, and you have a look at how much uh, do they contribute to your corpus, you'll find about 6% of your corpus consisting of these uh, most frequent five items. And if you extend the list to about 67 most frequent items, that will suddenly amount to a whole 50% of your corpus. Now obviously there are many, many more English words than just 67. So in fact, the corpus where I get these statistics from, our parallel corpus Cheng, contains more than one million different words. But half of the volume of the corpus are these 67 most frequent ones. And the remaining more than one million items makes the tale. So for example, there is still no word for someone who learns everything from watching videos. Oh, thank you for that. But sometime such a word may emerge and suddenly your empty system may be asked to translate it into Spanish. 
And obviously you'll have to wait for a very long time and you'll have to gather a lot of text until you have an example how this word, how this new word should be translated into English. So to properly capture not only the, the beginning, the very frequent items, but also the endless tail of unique items, you have to generalize well. And let's admit it, current natural language processing methods are very bad at generalizing the same way as humans do. Which is actually good news. There's still a lot of room for your own research and your own contribution. So don't feel bad when everything you write is being recorded. Big Brother is not only watching, he's learning from you. So enjoy it and contribute especially to open sources like the Wikipedia. It's also wise to mark your contributions with a permissive license such as the Creative Commons. Or join the research community to fight the Zips law. Thanks for watching today. You have learned about the enormous NLP greed for data. The sky is the limit, but you have seen that the sky is also pretty close. If we want our methods to improve faster than the new data arrives, we have to think about clever generalization techniques. That's it for today. Next time we're going to align sentences in Power Corpora.